Good, Good evening. evening, everyone. Shall we begin with a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening thankful for life, thankful for the blessings. We pray now that you be with Brother Obert as he breaks to us the bread of life. We pray, Lord, for the presence of the Holy Spirit, that you'll be with him, that he may speak your words, that we may learn more of you. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. We're going to begin with a song called, Now You Can Walk With Me. Jesus did we can walk with him amen welcome everyone and welcome brother Albert the time is yours we're looking forward to the next message that the Lord has given you welcome thank you so much as always uh, for the music and uh, 
Thank you to those who could join today as we get to the uh, midpoint of our session. I'm happy again to be uh, joining you uh, to talk about uh, uh, Jesus. Shall we pray before we start? Father in heaven, once again, we're grateful for your mercies which endure forever. Lord, may you be glorified and exalted so that there is none of me but all of you. Fill us with your spirit this evening, Father, and impress us with your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Today we will uh, take uh, again our verses in the book of Revelation, and then we will go to the book of Ezra, just at the beginning. So today we'll only read uh, Revelation 14, uh, verse 8. A second angel followed and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, which made all the nations drink the maddening wine of their adulteries. And if you come with me to the book of Ezra, this is how it reads. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to make a proclamation throughout his realm and also to put it in writing. This is what Cyrus, king of Persia, said. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. And he has appointed me to build a temple for him at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of his people among you may go up to Jerusalem in Judah and build the temple of the Lord, the God of Israel. The God who is in Jerusalem and may their God be with them. And in any locality where survivors may now be living. The people are to provide them with silver and gold, with goods and livestock, and with free will offerings for the temple of God in Jerusalem. Then the family heads of Judah and Benjamin, and the priests and Levites, everyone whose heart God had moved, prepared to go up and build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. It's been 70 years have come. A whole generation of God's people has passed on. Many have taken heed of that promise that God gave them that we find in the book of Jeremiah 29. It reads from verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray, the, pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. So, friends, we see the children of Israel. In spite of being exiled, life has turned out to be not so bad in Babylon. Enterprising Jews have done well. Many hold positions of influence. We know some were governors like Daniel. Some were cup bearers like Nehemiah. Some were business owners. And some were even successful skilled workers. They have married and given in marriage. We have new generations of Jewish children, men who have not seen the land of milk and honey that their forefathers used to talk about. And unlike in Egypt, here they are not in deep bondage as exiles. Life is good because God does not abandon his people and his covenant. Friends, God does not abandon his people and his covenant. So he's been with them in Babylon and he has kept them safe. Why? Because God is faithful. Do you remember the promise in Genesis that God made to Abraham, strengthening it in symbolism and in deep oath? We read when you go with me to Genesis chapter 15 from verse 7, it says, he also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of air of the Chaldeans to give you this land to take possession of it. 
But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abraham brought all these things to him, cut them in two, and arranged the house opposite each other. The beds, however, he did not cut in half. Then the beds of prey came down on the carcasses, but Abraham drove them away. As the sun was setting, Abraham fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the scene of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. When the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. That promise, is, that promise friends, was fulfilled because God is faithful. We can see after 430 years, the children of Israel have increased in number to more than a million, just as God has promised, and they are in the promised land. In passing through the midst of the cut sacrifices here in this promise, God is saying to Abraham, if I do not fulfill what I have promised, let this happen to me also. Friends, the significance of this oath, it doesn't seem to be so deep for us, because for us, we easily break promises and we can lie. We easily give up and we turn away from friends, from family, from church pledges. We can be moody and even fickle. But for God, there's no room to be fickle or moody. His promises are steadfast and true. They are yes and amen. God has never let go of his people and he has never let them down. God is faithful. Listen to the testimony of his servants in Daniel chapter 9, verse 4 to 6. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keeps his commandments. We have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We've turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets. Who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land? The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. God is faithful to his people. We may let him down, but I want to promise you, God remains faithful. He will not let us down. I don't know what situation you are in. Just remember this. It is not God who is letting you down. It may be people, it may be circumstances, but the promise from God's word is the Lord is faithful, merciful, forgiving, even when we have rebelled against him. God is good indeed. In Ezra chapter 9, we are told, from the days of our ancestors, from verse 7, until now, our guilt has been great. Because of our sins, we and our kings and our priests have been subjected to the sword and captivity, to pillage and humiliation at the hand of foreign kings, as it is today. But now for a brief moment, the Lord our God has been gracious in leaving us a remnant and giving us a firm place in his sanctuary. And so our God gives light to our eyes and a little relief in our bondage. Though we are slaves, our God has not forsaken us in our bondage. He has shown us kindness in the sight of the kings of Persia. Friends, God is faithful. God can be trusted even when we are in bondage. Know this, God is with you. I don't know what bondage you are facing, friends, because there are many types of bondages. Ezra promises us that God will be with us. Just like he was with the three young men in the fire, God will be with you because God is faithful. That is who he is. He cannot help himself. That is his nature. And in another place, Micah also testifies in chapter 7, verse 18 to 20. 
who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance. You do not stay angry forever, but you delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hail all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. Friends, whilst the enemy accuses us day and night, the Bible tells us that God will have compassion on us. He will tread our sins underfoot. We have nothing to fear. You have nothing to fear from your weaknesses. Come with them to Jesus. He will not abandon you because our God is faithful. Then in verse 20 we read, you will be faithful to Jacob, the deceiver. Show and show love to Abraham, the man who was a liar, as you pledged on oath to our ancestors in days long ago. God is faithful, friends. Even the crying prophet in Lamentation chapter 3 confesses, This I recall to my mind. Therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions, they fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The psalmist will not be left behind in Psalms 42, verse 5, he says, Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Friends, God will give us opportunity to praise him. I do not want to lie to you. There will be a day when you will see the faithfulness of God. All you have to do is put your trust in him, because our God is faithful. No matter what bondage we put ourselves in, God remains faithful. Again, in Psalm 30, we are told, I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes, my foes or my enemies rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave. You kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, you saints of his, and give thanks at, his, at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Praise God, for he is faithful. God always comes through for us, friends. It's been 70 years, and now God comes through again for the children of Israel. We can see him again here in the book of Ezra. He has come through for his people. When they thought that things were bad, that they would never return to Jerusalem, God brings a man to change the situation because God is faithful and his promises are sure. We can see again here, he has come through for his people. The opportunity to return to the promised land has come without even a fight. Many a times we want to battle. We want to struggle. But all that God has done is be faithful and the opportunity has returned. We need to give God room so that he can show us his faithfulness. Friends, prophecy tells us we're also living at the end of our 70 years. It is time to go home. I don't know why some of you still want to stay here, but Christ is calling us home. Our 70 years is about to end. Friends, I know none of us know what Eden is like, except in reference to our suffering. We have heard that we want that city where there is no suffering, where there is no more pain, no more crying, and no separation from our loved ones. None of us has seen this new land. Our experience of life is confined to this sin-drenched earth. And unfortunately, unfortunately, I'm not so sure. But because God has been faithful, a number of us are living well. To many of us, life has been good. God has blessed us. We have built houses. Some have married. Some even built successful businesses. God has been good to some of you. God has been good, in fact, to all of us here. Life may be often good friends, but we are exiles here. It is time to go home. Our 70 years is almost up. But friends, do you know that to want to go to the new Jerusalem demands humility? For humility is simply the disposition which prepares the soul for living on trust. For have you not read, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. 
And elsewhere we've been told, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who is of a contrite and humble spirit. Again, the message from Peter also implores us, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. It is not easy to trust that there is a better world when you have not seen it. For life has been good here, friends. Particularly, some of you, your situations have been tenable. You don't want to change them. It may sound like myth, like fiction, like stories, like a way of escaping. But friends, we know it is time to go home. We know we have another home. This is not our home. We are at the cusp of history, friends. It may not seem like so, because it does not always seem like that. But Ezra has some lessons for us. First, we notice when we read the first paragraph of Ezra, we live in a world where rulers determine destinies of people, families, and individuals. For 70 years, for many years, Babylon has ruled over the children of Israel. They seem to have been suffering at the hands of these kings. They seem to have been at the mercy of these kings. Like these people will determine their day-to-day -day living and their tomorrow. Friends, even us today, to survive. We constantly are scanning, looking at global economic policies, at geopolitical alliances, at areas of interest and exploitation by superpowers. And we try also to align to these so that I can get a good job. I can get a good living. We seem to be at the mercies of our rulers. We try to make sure also that we vote for those who represent our interests best. We want to vote for someone who will make sure the welfare program will continue to take care of us even when we retire. Who will not take us as too much that we have good roads, good services, good amenities, that the NHS may work well, friends, that our, school, our children may go to free schools. We want to make sure we get these alliances in place. But friends, have you noticed, somehow these people always find a way to disappoint us. Yet we seem to be at the mercy of these powers. They seem to have power over our happiness. But I want to say this. Even when they do well or when they disappoint, we are not to be blinded to think that they own our destinies. I have good news for you from Ezra. Friends, you are not at the mercy of anyone but God. Your destiny is in God's hands. So please align with him. We want to challenge Pilate today as Jesus did and remind him, you would have no power over me were it not given to you from above. So friends, we are looking for a better city with foundations, which architect and builder is God, whose ruler is God. He is the one who will set a policy that will always be favorable to me. He will never let us down. We are looking for that city with foundations, friends. This world, which seems to be at the mercy of these rulers, is not God is in control. He determines the times. He determines where we will go. The second point we find in the book of Ezra in that chapter is, in spite of the seeming Herculean influence and impact of these earthly political and financial powers on this earth, it is God who stays and moves hearts and minds of rulers and those in positions of power. Friends, ultimately, God governs the great global affairs of history regarding his people. I'm reminded again of Daniel chapter 2, verse 20 to 22, where he tells us, Praise be to the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He deposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. It is God who is in control, friends. It's not our politicians not the prime minister, not the MPs. They may seem to see, have some control here, but the Bible tells us that it is God who is control of our time. He is control also of our life. Friends, God has chosen Jerusalem for his temple is in Jerusalem. God's temple may be in Jerusalem, but his acts and mission are global. In the time of Ezra, the restoration of Jerusalem was important. You may ask why this tiny city? Does that not limit God's influence? Why not keep them in Babylon and build on from there? 
because friends, God is bigger than Jerusalem. Yet from Jerusalem, he will reach the world. A tiny city can have cosmic impact. Jerusalem is particular because it is God's plan and God's plans are particular. Even you may be, you may be one who seemingly is insignificant as an individual, but God has an eternal purpose for you. Your actions have eternal consequences and effects. So don't despise the power of God. Even today, friends, the proclamation is simple. You are the temple of God. From you, many must be reached. The sovereign God says, do not look down on his plan. This world is not the plan. He is a better one for us. We must go to Jerusalem. The third point we see is the word of God remains true, steadfast, and can be trusted. Friends, significant events begin with the word of the Lord. For our benefit, Isaiah mentioned Cyrus way even before he's born. And for our benefit, we discover from Ezra chapter 1 that Jeremiah prophesied that 70 years were marked out for God's people. And at the right time, the event is fulfilled. What God has promised comes to pass because God's word shall always come to pass. There is therefore a word for our situation, friends. As I have always said, I don't know what situation you are in, but there is a word for our situation. And even today, there is a word for our situation, friends. It's time for Jerusalem. We tend to view prophecy with trepidation, but we should not. Literal, literal Babylon with Nebuchadnezzar and his son and his family fell. Persia took over and fell. The Greeks came and they went. In these last days where we are in the throes of another power, which seeks to distort the character of, our God, of God's kingdom, this prophetic Babylon will also fall as the Bible has told us. Have you not read its verdicts? It is clear. There is an emphasis. Fallen, fallen is Babylon. This prophecy, friends, is true and it is sure. And this is the word for our season, friends. Fallen, fallen is Babylon. It's time to go back to Jerusalem. This prophecy is true, it is sure. For God's word is sure and steadfast. This false kingdom will fall. Christ's dominion will take its place. The exiles must return. They must come out of Babylon. So what must we do, friends? We are being called back to Eden, to that new Jerusalem. But first, we must want to go there. You must ask yourself, though, do I want to go there and why? Friends, where are we being called to? We are not going there for milk and honey like the Israelites. Because we have plenty of those in our homes and in our shops. You can go to Tesco and get all of these without any problem. No, we are not going there for milk and honey anymore. We are not going there for illness-free living. For it is now possible to live without pain by just popping some pain pills each day. We are not going there to have a good time. You can buy a holiday package and escape to Madeira, wherever you want. Friends, the city of Babylon can cater to your immediate needs without much worry. But we want more. We are longing for more. Deep down in our beings, like the rich young ruler, we are asking, say, I have these things and I have done everything. But how shall I inherit eternal life? I seek for more than what Babylon has been offering me. I have gold and silver, but I'm looking for more. I'm looking for foundations. And we know Jesus' answer, friends, because it is simple. In, in the book of Matthew, he tells us, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The key is right there, friends. We want that rest that Christ gives, that peace that only Jesus can give us. And we will find it in that new Jerusalem, friends. But even before we go there, the promise is that we can start having it even right now. The key is right there, friends. We must learn about the gentleness and the humility, the meekness of our Savior. For in there, we will see his love and we will find rest. Friends, the preparation for the return to Jerusalem starts with coming to Christ and learning of him. There must be a coming out and a rebuilding which must take place before the full restoration of Jerusalem. 
What strikes me, friends, is this statement from the Lord's servant. Everything in heaven is noble and elevated. All seek the interest and happiness of others. No one devotes himself to looking out and caring for self. It is the chief joy of all holy beings to witness the joy and happiness of those around them. Friends, this attitude must start even right now. So that preparation for the kingdom must start now. And this can only come when we have Christ in our heart. When we have come to him, we are at rest. We are at peace. We have that humility of Christ. And we can devote ourselves to looking out for others. Friends, again, listen to what the Lord's servant says. Why we need to come out and be read. In his sinless state, men held joyful communion with him in whom I hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. But after his sin, he could no longer find joy in holiness, and he sought to hide from the presence of God. Such is still the condition of the unrenewed heart. It is not in harmony with God and finds no joy in communion with him. The sinner could not be happy in God's presence. He would shrink from the companionship of holy beings. Could he be permitted to enter heaven? It would have no joy for him. The spirit of unselfish love that reigns there, every heart responding to the heart of infinite love, would touch no answering chord in his soul. His thoughts, his interests, his motives would be alien to those that actuate the sinless dwellers there. He could be a discordant knot in the melody of heaven. Heaven would be to him a place of torture. He would long to be hidden from him who is its light and the center of its joy. It is no arbitrary degree on the part of God that excludes the wicked from heaven. They are shut out by their own unfitness for his companionship. The glory of God would be to them a consuming fire. They would welcome destruction that they might be hidden from the face of him who died to redeem them what he said state friends. But we can be prepared to be happy in God's presence. Friends, remember also in heaven, not only do the, fall, the faithful follow the lamp wherever he goes, but we are also told, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. What a privilege to be invited into the presence of the Savior, daily to look upon his character. This is what we desire, to be in the presence of God, to sit with him, to listen to him, to go back to that state when we can hear God's word, but we must be read. We must be read. The Lord's servant reminds us, friends, human language is inadequate to describe the reward of the righteous. It will be known only to those who behold it. Friends, I wish to behold it. No finite mind can comprehend the glory of the paradise of God. But friends, we have this opportunity. If we are to come to Christ today, we will be part of those who will see this spectacle which no human being can explain right now to us. Friends, we must go to that city, New Jerusalem, that our faithful God has promised us. We must come out from this Babylon. We must come to Christ, be made like him, to develop the same character so that we can love the presence of God. Our faithful Jesus is waiting today. His call is come. Come unto me, and I'll give you rest for your souls. May God bless you, and may his abundant presence continue to be with us. Amen. 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 We'd like to thank uh, Amen. for that timely message. Um, Yes, we've got such a glorious future if we stay faithful to Jesus. He's been faithful to us throughout throughout our lives. We must stay faithful to him. And then we can inherit eternal life and be with Jesus. Amen. We're looking forward to that. Thank you for that message. We're going to end with a song called Language of Canaan. Of care. 
I could tell a little of the glory of a better world where there is no night and the Lamb is the light where no teardrops fall Oh, heaven is not like here at all Oh, that I could talk in the language of Kenya I could tell a little of the glory of a better world The wonderful things the Lord has shown me of heaven. I cannot describe. I saw their tables of stone in which the names of the 144,000 were engraved with letters of gold. After we beheld the glory of the temple, we went out and Jesus left us and went into the city. Soon we heard his lovely voice again saying, Come, my people, you have come out of great tribulation and done my will, suffered for me. Come into supper, for I myself will serve you. We shouted, Hallelujah, glory, and entered into the city. And I saw a table of pure silver. It was many miles in length, yet our eyes could extend over it. I saw the manna, almonds, figs, pomegranates, grapes, and many other kinds of fruit. Then Jesus said you must go back to earth again and relate to others what I have revealed to you. Then an angel bore me gently down to this dark world. Sometimes I think I can stay here no longer. All things on earth look so dreary. I feel very alone here, for I have seen a better land. Oh, for wings like a dove, so that I could fly away. I'd sail across the Jordan to a better place where the sweet repose and the living water flows and I fast no I long to reach your shore Oh, that I could talk in the language of Kenya I could tell a little of the glory of a better world I could tell a little of the glory of a better world of a better world of a better world That song is based on early writing page of 19 and 20. We long for that better world, don't we? we this do. world is finished. There's nothing left mm. for us here but to go home. Amen. 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 We'd like to thank Brother Obert for that message. Um, Sister Dion, are you able to close in prayer for us, please? Yes, certainly. Let's pray. 
<clears throat> Our Father, we just want to thank you once again for your manservant who shared the bread of life with us. We want to thank you. We want to thank you that you have reminded us that there is a better place. We want to thank you that you've reminded us that you are faithful and we ought to stay faithful also because you've gone to prepare a better place for us. We just want to thank you, Lord Jesus. We want to thank you, our Lord and our God, for being so good to us and being so patient with us. I'm asking you that you will bless each and every person who have listened to these words this evening, where you've touched your manservant, you've touched him to share with us a word from you. We know it's a word from you because you told us that you've gone to prepare a place. I'm asking you that you'll be with each and every one of us and that you will give us a good night rest. May you also bless the speaker. May you um, inspire him to come back again, to share more of what you have in store for us. We praise you. We honor you. We thank you. There is none like you. Bless this prayer retreat also. Dear Lord, keep it going. We know that it is you that is working these things through. We bless your name. We honor you. We worship you. We thank you so much for all that you do and you continue to do for us. We honor you, dear Lord. Please be with each and every one this evening as we go away to rest. Thank you for everything. Be with us. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen and amen. 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 Thank you. Uh, Sister Diane for that prayer at 4.45 it will be morning prayer and at 5.30 Desire of Ages 12 o'clock midday prayer band and at 6.30 song service followed by another time the message from Brother Herbert we're looking forward to that message tomorrow evening so have a nice evening everyone and 23rd to 29th of December is All Roads Lead to Kevin Lee for the Winter Retreat so See you tomorrow, by God's grace. Good night. Good night.